Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Thanks, Jen. Lauren, I will be definitely calling you to uh, get some help on magnetism. But I'm thrilled to be here with you guys today to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, healthcare innovation. And when I say close to my heart, I actually mean literally close to my heart. As Jen mentioned, I've done research um, at the Stanford Stem Cell Institute um, for regenerative medicine and stem cell biology for about two and a half years. And me, along with some other um, scientists I worked with, we developed this technology to take skin cells, so literally your skin cells, turn them into these induced pluripotent stem cells, which are basically what we call stem cell-like cells. And then we can turn those stem cells into any cell of the body. I was working with some cardiologists, so we decided to turn them into actually beating heart cells. So we can take your skin, turn it into a stem cell, then turn it into a beating heart cell on a dish. The coolest thing about the technology, if that wasn't cool enough to begin with, is that your beating heart cells in a dish actually recapitulate any heart disease that you have. So let's say your heart beats arrhythmically, which is something that a lot of um, people in the United States have. Then your beating heart cell on a dish, even though it never actually came from your heart, will beat arrhythmically on a dish. It's pretty cool. So <laughs> what we decided to do, there's so many applications for this, um, one of which is if someone has a heart attack, we can actually take their cells, turn them into their own heart cells, and in inject them back into their heart to repair heart functionality. So two years and about 17 publications later, I decided to drop out of Stanford. I was an undergrad, dropped out my sophomore year to start this company called Stem Cell Theranostics. And I was so bright-eyed. I thought we were going to change the world. We were going to reduce the amount of money it took to develop these drugs because we can now perform what I like to call a clinical trial in a dish, where we can take skin samples from people of all different ethnic backgrounds, um, of different kind of heart conditions, and have this literally a library of over 500 patient-specific cells. Some people demonstrate rare heart diseases. Some people just demonstrate, you know, you have the normal phenotypes. Um, and you could test these drugs before they ever get tested on humans to see whether or not they'll actually be safe. Um, but yeah, so I, I figured, you know, if I can take skin and turn it into a heart cell, how hard could it be to actually commercialize this? Well, very famous last words. Um, so decided to start the company, and that's kind of when shit hit the fan. <laughs> um, some of the biggest lessons I learned through my research were actually not related to stem cells at all. The first and probably most valuable lesson I learned is that scientists are not cut out to be founders. And this is, this is kind of shocking, being a scientist myself. Um, but think about it. We're bred in an environment where you need to keep things close to the chest. The way that you advance in science and research is you have to be the first person to publish. And they have to be positive result, results. You never see people going around talking about failures. You never see a publication in Nature Medicine or the New England Journal of Medicine saying, oh, we tried a bunch of experiments. Nothing worked. Because of that, Everyone else goes and tries the same experiments. Nothing works. It's just a big waste of time. Um, and so the people that keep the secrets the best are the ones that go and get the publications. They don't share their methodologies. They don't share their advancements. They keep it. They make a, they make a ton of figures. They get that publication. People that get those top publications are the ones that are awarded research grants. So now you have these labs that are getting the research grants because they kept secrets close to their chest. And now they're breeding the next generation of scientists because they can afford to pay for them. And they're all keeping their secrets close to the chest, too. This is literally Darwinism at its finest. The second thing I realized is that we push away the only person that actually has an incentive to help us, which is big pharmaceutical companies. And I don't know how much you guys know about Stanford, but Stanford School of Medicine actually has this policy where if you're from a pharmaceutical company like Pfizer or Genentech, you're actually not even allowed to come on campus. Some of my finest memories um, while doing research was that we would have all these reps. So a Pfizer rep would stand literally the street right across from campus or right off campus with donuts. And they'd have their big <laughs> Pfizer sign, and that was Literally, the only exercise I would get during the week is walking across the street to go get donuts from Pfizer. <laughs> and so there are these fundamental factors preventing scientists from going out there and, and becoming successful. 
one year into starting our company, we had literally made zero progress. We weren't even able to license our technology that we invented out of the university. So I took a, I took a look around at my peers. Stanford University is well known for um, students, many of them you know, from undergrad, dropping out, starting these amazing companies. So I, t I asked around to my consumer IT friends, my friends starting enterprise IT companies, even some of my friends starting hardware companies. And they all looked so happy. They had users, they had money, they were able to take showers. None of these were things that we were able to do with our biotech company. And that's kind of when I put two and two together. And I realized that without a serious shift in the culture of healthcare innovation, nothing was gonna change. So a year into starting Stem Cell Theranostics, I also started StartX Med, which is a nonprofit organization to help medical entrepreneurs kind of grow and advance and commercialize these amazing technologies that often don't make it out of the university because of all these challenges. Um, and so the first session of StartX Med, it was a three month program. The only thing I did was put these medical entrepreneurs and sat them right next to consumer IT entrepreneurs and healthcare, uh, or hardware entrepreneurs and enterprise IT entrepreneurs. I did not let two medical companies sit next to each other. That was the only rule. And the first session, we saw some amazing things. Some of the conversations I overheard were consumer IT companies going up to a medical founder and saying, what do you mean you're not gonna generate revenue for three years? And the, the medical entrepreneur would say, I don't know, that's just how medicine is. And then the consumer IT founder would say, but why? And no one would have an answer to that. Why is it that medical founders never generate revenue until their series F or series G? Why is it that founders always have this expectation that it's gonna take us 25 years before anything happens? We need to change that paradigm. I would see an IT founder complain about bugs. They'd be very open about the fact that things weren't going well. And then they'd turn around and ask a medical founder and say, what's been going wrong with you lately? And at first, I would see a lot of hesitation. And then over time, I would see people start to open up. I heard one person say, look, we're having a really hard time getting our technology out of the university. And then the consumer IT founder turned around and said, oh, hey, I know someone that can help you with that. And the next week, that founder was able to go and license their technology out. It was really, really powerful. I saw gray-haired professors, one of my co-founders is, is, fits that description, sit side by side next to 20-year-old hackers and literally kill kind of the medical hierarchy which currently exists. They sat side by side and suddenly they were peers. Um, because of kind of this, this experimental environment that we, we were starting to create, Stanford Hospital, Merck, and Johnson & Johnson all signed on to help kind of foster this community. We were finally letting Big Pharma in to help give us advice, help give us kind of the expertise needed to help some of these medical founders advance. So these stories are all nice, they're all kind of qualitative, but I want to share with you some ways that it has actually translated into quantitative success. So first I'm gonna start with just some stats on our own company since we've been a part of this community. First thing, we raised over $20 million in non-dilutive funding. So didn't have to give even 1% of equity, got $20 million, and that was because three other founders in our community helped, gave us their grants, and showed us what to do and what not to do. Second thing we did was we signed on three revenue-generating customers. This was before ever raising even a seed round. So we are generating revenue before having raised money. Um, we got an exclusive license to our technology, which is a huge win for us. Um, and now we're raising a $6.5 million seed round. Um, and we're, we, ha we have product, and we haven't even been around for uh, two years. And every little thing that I mentioned that helped us was because of one person or another in our community. Um, and I want to just leave you with some kind of aggregated statistics. So StartX Med has been around for now a year. We've supported 25 medical companies. They span from the digital health space to medical devices to biotech, biopharma, you know, drug development, really, really hard industries to be in. So those 25 medical companies in aggregate have raised over $81 million. I'm sure you all know it's incredibly difficult to get funding for a medical company. Second thing, in just a year, we've gotten two FDA approvals. So StartX med companies are able to get FDA approvals in 50% of the time that it takes 
the kind of the national average for, for getting one of those approvals, which is kind of amazing. Our Startex med companies are moving 2.7 times faster than their peers in their own industries. So you know that there's something going on about the, the ability to collaborate and share information and be vulnerable and kind of learn from each other. Um, and the last statistic, which is one of my favorite, is that every top 10 pharmaceutical company is a customer of at least one of our medical companies. And most of them you know, are pre-Series A. So they're generating revenue, they're creating incredible technologies, they're learning, they're growing, they're developing as founders, even though they're kind of scientists who have been trained to not kind of display any of these characteristics. So thank you guys for listening and happy to take questions.